And here we go. Welcome back to Tomlin's Tips, NFL Conference Championship Round Edition of the 2019-2020 season. I'm your host, Michael Tomlin. And as always, this podcast is brought to you by FantasySixPack.net, industry leader in fantasy football and gambling content. This week, we did our first mock draft of the 2020 fantasy football season, so be sure to swing by and check it out. There's definitely some surprises on certain guys' value. I was shocked, even. I also have weekly football bets, a weekly football bets column that just finished a really good college season. Speaking of the college season, this week's a little bit of a bittersweet weekend. College football season's officially over, and it pains me to think there are just three more football games that count for almost eight months. I know, it's going to be a tough one. Here in a few months, during the doldrums of buzzer, I mean, I mean baseball season, we will be all be longing for some Wednesday night in action. So don't take these last two games for granted. I mean, I guess we can get invest in the XFL, but let's not kid ourselves. It's probably not lasting that long. Anyway, the college season ended with a bang as I hit my LSU pick as well as over. I was a late score there, too, from hitting a pleaser that would have paid 10-1, to 1, so that was exciting in the end. My best bets for college football ended up at 59, 51, and 1 for a nice little profit. My bowl picks were extremely hot, finishing at 27, 13 against the spread. I just wish I was a little more confident in some of those ones I won. Nevertheless, on the NFL side, I had an even weekend going 2 and 2 with my best bets. I actually felt good about my picks last week, though. 49ers Viking game, 49ers Vikings game went exactly like I thought and explained on last week's podcast. At one point, the 49ers were 6 of 9 on third down and had a 20-minute possession time advantage. Two keys that I did point out last week. 49ers were able to drive all over the Vikings like I thought, as well as get to Kirk Cousins and force mistakes. The over in the Chiefs-Texans game also hit, and the Chiefs covered it by themselves in some spots. Now, the Baltimore and Tennessee game opened my eyes a little bit. It's something I really had not realized before. Lamar Jackson cannot come from behind. He has yet to come from behind by more than a single score in his young NFL career. This season, he never overcame more than a six-point deficit. I even got an argument on Twitter share tonight. No way! When I said that the game against the Titans proved two things. Lamar was not a better all-around quarterback than Pat Mahomes, and he was nowhere near worth a round one pick in 2020 fantasy football drafts. People grilled me for it, but I stand by these statements completely. The counter-argument was that he had 500 yards of offense. However, they still got their doors blown off. The game showed that relying on Lamar too much, especially when behind, is not good for their team as a whole. His offensive game depends on having that modernized triple option. Will he hand it to Mark Egram? Is he going to take off, or will he dump it over the top? When he has that triple option, he's almost he's pretty impossible to defend. However, when he's constantly forced into passing situations, he does not have the touch to throw guys open. People kept pointing to receiver drops and stuff for him last week, but some of those, quote, drops were not drops. They were bad passes the receiver might have got his hand on, but he didn't really have a chance to catch it. I think his statistics will seriously regress next season. My other loss is pretty disheartening. Whenever you have a team that is getting 10 points. So just keep it within t- double digits, two scores, not that hard, especially when you are leading by 24. I had 34 points of wiggle room there to win that bet. You, you feel like you're going to win that. I'll take the official loss, but hopefully everyone hedged on the massive Chiefs odds when the score is 24 nothing. I think it reached plus 400 on the money line for Kansas City, and I know I bet big on them at plus 17 and a half in the first half when they were down 24, so I ended up making a tidy profit on the game. So we head into the Final Four of the NFL. It's the first time in 14 years that the AFC Championship does not have a Super Bowl winning quarterback in it. Obviously, that's mostly due to Brady going to so many, but there were others without him between Peyton and Big Ben. But it definitely kind of feels like a passing of the old guard, especially in that AFC. You also have two quarterbacks in their first playoff runs ever, Ryan Tannehill and Jimmy G, and Pat is in his second playoff season. Aaron Rodgers, all of a sudden, is officially the elder statesman of the group. But enough with all that, let's dive into these two games. First game of the weekend, the AFC Championship. Number six seeded Tennessee Titans traveling the number two seeded Kansas City Chiefs. We got 2.05 central start time on Sunday. The current line is Kansas City by seven with an over under of 51. I believe Kansas City is about three, minus 3.51 on the money line, and the Titans are plus 2.79. Tennessee has covered seven of nine coming into this game, and they've covered and won five straight on the road. 
They're actually 7-3 and three against the spread on the road, and that includes a couple Mariota games. Kansas City has won and covered 7 straight, 8 of 9. Their only loss to these Tennessee Titans. We'll get to that here in a second. Kansas City is 10-4 and four against the spread as a favorite this season, 12-5 and five against the spread overall, 8-3 and three against the spread in non-division games. These guys have really been a solid cover, whether Pat or Matt Moore was starting. Now, both of these championship games are rematches. Kansas City lost to Tennessee 38-35 and was in what was arguably the weirdest and most hurt gambling ending of the season, especially for myself. With a minute 36 left, Kansas City had a 95% chance to win that game when they had per FBI when they had third and two on the Tennessee 24. They had already missed an extra point in the third quarter, and then they had a botched field goal attempt on that on that next fourth down play. Tennessee came back, tied it, or took the lead. Sorry, it would have tied there to made that field goal, but they came back, took a three point lead. However, Pat had 30 seconds, so he took the Chiefs within kicking distance. And it was a blocked field goal that would have forced overtime. In that game, Pat had 446 yards passing. However, Derrick Henry had 23 carries for 188 yards. Now, this was before his recent tear, so I can only guess this is going to happen again, especially when you look at the best backs, I think, that the Chiefs faced that were healthy at the time. Josh Jacobs went for 17 and one for 104 and then 12 for 99. Henry had the 23 for 188, and Mark Ingram went 16 for 103. The Chiefs are susceptible to the best backs, just as New England was in the wild card round against these Titans, and we saw how that worked out. Kansas City finished 26th in the league in rushing yards allowed per game. On the whole, Tennessee has a number two offense by pro football focus, and Kansas City has a 24th defense. Neither team can really get after the quarterback that well, but they do block well as both teams are top 12 in pass blocking and bottom four in pass rushing. So that could lead to longer drives as there are not going to be as many sacks, especially if Chris Jones isn't playing for the Chiefs. Tennessee is actually sneakily third per fo- pro football, football focus in, rec- in receiving, while Kansas City is 20th in covering receivers. A.J. Brown had been going off the last two weeks. He kind of disappeared, but they didn't need him. As you've heard, the Titans barely had 200 yards passing in the last two, two playoff wins. The biggest factor, though, in this game is going to be running the ball. Tennessee is 5th in the league in running the ball and 4th in stopping the run. Kansas City is 24th in rushing and 29th in defending the run. I mean, both these teams are phenomenal on offense as Tennessee was 4th in yards per play and Kansas City was 2nd, and then both were about average on yard, defensive yards per play. <clears throat> so what really makes a difference in this game? I think the Chiefs got really lucky last week that Bill O'Brien is such a pushover as a coach. He had a couple of shots to really put the nail in the coffin, but he just he couldn't pull the trigger. He chose poorly in kicking that field goal there early in the second quarter, and then going for it on the fourth down on his own end was just reckless. What gets lost in the amazing Pat Mahomes comeback is that he used to turn into a team that they are not, a run-the-clock-out, smash-mouth, finish-the-game type squad. Tennessee, on the other hand, has no problem playing either a shootout, like the first game against the Chiefs, or a game to get the lead and rely completely on Derrick Henry, like their last two playoff wins. Their ability to adapt to whatever the game flow is makes me believe they can keep this game within a touchdown. I see it as a high-scoring, last-team-with-the-ball-wins type meeting, so give me the seven points along with the over. Next game, win the NFC Championship. The number two-seeded Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers trying to get to his second Super Bowl, which seems strange that he's only been to one. They're traveling to the top-seeded San Francisco 49ers, 5.40 Central Start. Current line is San Francisco by seven. I do think there are some seven and a halfs out there as well, with an over under of 46 and a half. Uh, the 49ers money line minus 336, Green Bay plus 264. Green Bay has won six straight. However, their last loss was to these 49ers. The under in Green Bay's games is four, has hit four or five times in seven of nine. Good get spread trend for San Francisco is there eight and three against the spread in non-division games. In that first matchup, 49ers beat Green Bay 37 to 8. They got out to a 23-0 halftime lead and just wrote it out. Aaron Rodgers was 20 of 33 for only 104 yards, the lowest yardage total of his career in a game where he threw the ball at least 23 times. Jimmy G, on the other hand, was 14 for 20 for 253 yards and two touchdowns. George Kittle had six of those for 129 yards and a score. 
in that game, Green Bay had just 198 total yards and was 1 for 15 on third down. My question for this game, are we sure Green Bay is good? In the last 14 weeks leading to the playoffs, the Packers played just four playoff teams. One of them was a victory against the Matt Moore-led Chiefs when Pat Mahomes was hurt, and if you watched that game, it was closer than you would think. Another was a home loss against the hapless Eagles. Then there's this blowout loss to the 49ers we already talked about. Then they had one win in Minnesota, but does that make up for the failure against the other good teams? I mean, I pointed out last week that Green Bay had the 25th hardest schedule and was the only non-East Division team in that bottom nine and straight to schedule. I mean, how did they even get by Seattle last week? Didn't they get a little lucky, wouldn't you say? First was a two-point conversion by Seattle that was stuffed. That's a coin flip in itself. There was also the drop pass by, I believe, David Moore at the 50 when Seattle was driving to take the lead late, but they ended up punting. Then the game-ending third-down conversion by Jimmy Graham was clearly short, but was called the first down the field and somehow held up on replay. I mean, no, that means Seattle wins the game for sure, but a lot went Green Bay's win to at least get that cover. San Francisco, on the other hand, just absolutely dominated the Vikings. The 49ers show that their defensive line can get after a passer with no help from the back seven. This is especially huge against Green Bay as the Packers receivers were just 20th in the league per pro football focus at getting open, and the 49ers were the best team in the league at covering receivers. So if the 49ers can get to Rodgers as well as cover his receivers better than anyone, and they can also keep him off the field as San Francisco was 6th in the league in running the football and Green Bay was 25th at stopping the run. One other statistical discrepancy is when Green Bay is facing third downs. The Packers were 19th in the league in converting at just 37.79%, while San Francisco was second best in the league at stopping them. This was the major key the first time they played, as well as last week, especially when you talk about one for freaking 15, and that is unacceptable. So we have a situation where the 49ers can get after the quarterback while covering the receivers better than anyone, while keeping up Rangers off the field a lot, and they can get off on third down better than almost anyone. The cherry on top for San Francisco, yards per play. I know I talk about that a lot, but yards per play is a big handicapping st- statistic. It, it tells you more than total yards or just points, as sometimes there's late yardage in a game that can skew the total yards numbers or you know touchdowns are fluky. 49ers were fifth in the league in offensive yards per play and best in the league in defensive yards per play. They had a 1.3-yard positive margin in yards per play, which is pretty ridiculous when you think about how many plays are in each game. Green Bay is on the exact opposite end. They were below average in both categories and actually had a negative 0.3-yard per play discrepancy. So San Francisco has a 1.6-yards per play advantage on a team with a much worse schedule than they had. There is, on average, about 120 plays in a single NFL game. That equals out to 192 yards advantage over a game. That sounds good enough for me to give the seven points. And even if it's seven and a half, I'll, I'll still buy that half point to seven, but I'm still taking it. Now, as I already said, my best bet for the total is the over in the Tennessee-Kansas City game. For a 10-point teaser with so few options, I have to go with my two top picks. So Tennessee plus 17 and San Francisco plus three when you take the 10 points with each, along with my over pick in the Chiefs-Titans, so over 41. That's it for the NFL Conference Championship Round edition of Tomlin's Tips. Be sure to check out my article on fantasy6pack.net. Stay tuned for my mega Super Bowl podcast with all the prop bets you need. And as always, may all the coin flips go your way. Thanks.